Okay, uh, we are on uh, chapter 14 here, and uh, last time we got into acids and bases, and we got into really pH as well. So we saw some relationships. Remember, the pH scale runs from 0 to 7 uh, to 14, less than 7 uh, being acidic, above 7 there being basic, and really, the definition there of neutral is really a pH of 7. 7 is sort of your individual. I hear myself, so that's good. All right. So, I want to have that echo. Um, so, again, the pH scale running from 0 to 7 uh, to 14. And 7, again, is sort of your uh, midpoint, if you will. As you go closer to 14, uh, you become more basic. And as you go, obviously, towards zero there, you become more acidic. We saw some relationships, including one with water, which is known as Kw. Kw is a concentration of the H plus times concentration of the OH minus, and that equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14. It is an equilibrium constant. It does change with temperature, but pretty much in most applications, uh, that's going to be a constant number that you're going to have always available to you. Um, Remember as well that anywhere you see H+, plus, you can basically swap it out for the hydronium ion. Uh, they basically mean the same thing, both with formulas and equations. This will allow you to figure out either the H plus concentration or the OH minus concentration. And the relationship of those things are they are opposites of each other. So as one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Um, and obviously, if your H plus concentration is larger than your OH minus concentration, then you probably have an acidic solution. If your OH minus, which is the basic part of the solution, is greater than the H plus concentration, then it's going to be basic. And if they both equal each other, which means they both will have a concentration of 1 times 10 to minus 7, uh, they will have a, a neutral solution. We also... Talked about calculating pH. pH is equal to minus the log of the H plus concentration, or again, H3O plus. And remember that as we talked about as well, in addition with KW, you do want to make sure you are using your exponent button definitely in this chapter and all chapters. Uh, but also calculator-wise, in terms of how you punch it in, again, if you have a display calculator where when you hit log, it says log, you basically just punch it in exactly the way it shows. If you have a non-display calculator, which when you hit log, it shows error, you need to punch pretty much this formula and all the other ones in backwards, starting with the number, then log, and then the negative button. Um, there is a similar scale uh, that measures the OH minus concentration. That's known as the POH, which is minus the log of the OH minus concentration. The nice relationship between those two is, again, the pH plus the POH uh, will equal... 14. And we also talked about uh, that if you do have the pH value given to you, uh, that will allow you to directly from the pH value calculate the H plus concentration. It kind of tells you that a pH, you get the H plus from it. Or if you want to calculate pH, you need the H plus concentration. And that is going to be the inverse log of the negative pH. Again, on most people's calculators, when you do the inverse log function, it will usually pop up like a 10 and a carat. And again, you want to make sure that you do make it negative. You could do pretty much the identical calculation with the pOH. Also, you could get the OH minus concentration directly from that. And it's pretty much the identical calculation, the inverse log of the negative POH. And once again, on your calculator, that will look something like this. So this does give you sort of a variety of ways you can solve some of these problems. They all should really get you to the same spot, as long as obviously you do the calculation correctly. So in some cases, if you have the pH, you could just directly get the H+. Plus. Um, and once you have the H+, plus, you could also get the POH and get the OH minus that way, or you can still use KW to do it. They all, again, should give you the same answer. Remember, significant figure-wise, when we're doing something with pH, or going from pH or POH back to concentration, uh, pH or POH value should have the same number of decimal places as the number of significant figures there are in the concentration. 
And when you're going backwards, whatever number of decimal places the pH or pOH has is how many significant figures your concentration should have if you're kind of going in the backwards uh, sort of direction. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> okay. So I think we did these guys there, I think, to finish out, if I'm not mistaken. I feel like we did. Or did we? We did both of these, yeah. I think, yeah, okay. Did we do this one? Our industrial left off. Okay, let's pick up with this one then. Let's do this one. We're looking for uh, the pH, the pOH, and the OH minus concentration. Uh, if we have an H plus concentration of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6, and we'll just add to this, is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, so again, since we are given the H plus concentration, uh, we do have a couple of options. Uh, since we're looking for everything, we could go into KW and get the OH minus concentration if you want to do that. Uh, you could also, since you have the H plus, get the pH. So I'm going to go with the pH first. Uh, the pH here is going to be negative log of my H plus concentration, and that'll be negative log of uh, 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's going to get me there. We'll go with uh, 5.46 in terms of my pH. Again, still at this point, if you uh, wanted to, you could again use KW to get the OH minus. So for old time's sake, we'll roll that way. So the OH minus will be 1 times 10 to the minus 14, which is our KW. Uh, divided by our H plus concentration, 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6. And again, here, that would get us. And 2.9 uh, times 10 to the minus 9. This does need units as it's a concentration. Again, if you're not in scientific notation, you might have a whole bunch of zeros and like a 3 maybe at the end of your calculator. Um, you know, if you happen not to be maybe in scientific notation, your calculator might run out of space. And that's okay as well if it did. Um, now I got pH, I got OH minus. Obviously, pOH can be found, obviously, as this point two ways. We could either uh, use the pOH equation here. Or because, again, we do have the pH, we could use the pH plus the pOH is equal to 14. I'm going to choose that one there. So our pOH will equal 14 minus our 5.46. Again, it should really give you the same answer. Maybe slight difference if you did a little bit of rounding, uh, but you really should be pretty close no matter which way you kind of choose there. 8.54. Any questions on those calculations there? <clears throat> this guy is acidic, basic, neutral. This one is. It is acidic. So as we also talked about, I think, at the end last time, when you are asked that question, uh, there's only one answer, so don't give all the answers for the same solution. Once again, as we talked about last time, you probably should always look at the pH scale because I would say pretty much everybody, that is the uh, scale that they have in their head, where below 7 is acidic and above 7 is basic. I think I wrote on the uh, board last time, but just a reminder that the pOH scale is also to 14, but it runs opposite. So below 7 is basic and above 7 is acidic. So... Again, it is opposite if you look at the POH uh, sort of values there. So my recommendation, again, is just always look at the pH scale, since that's probably the one you most likely have in your head, and you'll probably be good in that case. Questions on any of those there? Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about acids and electrolytes and the relationship between acids. So... Strong electrolytes, as you might remember, electrolytes are substances that when they go for a swim in solution, they pretty much break apart into ions, right? Positive and negative ions floating around. And the presence of these ions is what helps it conduct electricity really well. Usually they like to show like a light bulb sort of example. Light bulb goes off really bright. If you put some electrodes that's connected to a light bulb into a strong electrolyte solution, and that's because there's a presence of pretty much 
100% ions in that solution. So if you dissolve some sodium chloride and you really had a sodium chloride solution, in that actual solution, you would have sodium ions floating around and chloride ions floating around. And in fact, that is all you would have floating around is just those ions. You would not have any sodium chloride units still together. So it would all be 100% basically broken apart into ions. And that's why it's able to conduct electricity really well because there's a lot of, obviously, ions floating around in that solution. Uh, weak electrolytes, on the other hand, are things that will actually mainly stay together in solution. So they mainly stay together. But will break apart a little bit. And... These are usually reversible reactions, equilibrium type reactions. And the difference is when you look at that type of solution, uh, you still have a majority of this guy, for example, still together. But you will have a little bit of it breaking apart into its ions. So it's still able to break apart a little bit into its ions. And there's still some ions floating around in that solution, which is why it's known as a weak electrolyte. It's still able to conduct electricity, but nowhere near as much as, say, a strong electrolyte will. So if you go like to the light bulb example, instead of it being very, very bright, the light bulb will turn on but be very, very dim, almost like it's dying. And But it will still be able to conduct electricity. Obviously, there's also non-electrolytes, which is not really sort of important for our conversation, perhaps. Uh, but non-electrolytes are stuff that will dissolve in solution. Uh, but will not produce any ions, so they don't conduct electricity. So sugar, for example, which is held together by uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, sharing of electrons doesn't break apart into ions, but will still dissolve in water. And because there's no ions, it will not conduct electricity. Now, acids and bases can also be strong electrolytes and, and weak electrolytes, more commonly referred to in terms of acids and bases as strong acids or weak acids, or strong bases and weak bases, basically. When we talk about strong bases, or sorry, strong acids to begin with, there is a list that, again, you probably should be familiar with. Uh, things like nitric acid is a strong acid. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. Our friend perchloric acid, hydrobromic acid, and hydroiodic acid. So this list of kind of six strong acids is really a good one to remember uh, because, frankly, if it's not one of those acids, it's probably a pretty safe bet there's going to be a weak acid in my case. So these are kind of your big six sort of strong acids. And again, if it's not one of those, probably a safe bet to know that it's going to be more of a weak acid. So... Again, each of these acids are strong acids because when they do break apart, for example, here, they will 100% break apart here. And we do have the water, uh, which is going to act as the base as the acid sends it over. So we will get H3O plus here in our equation instead of H plus, and it will produce Cl minus. And once again, it's going to be 100% what we got on the product side that's going to be in that solution. So it's going to produce really a lot of H plus freely in that solution. So when you take something like hydrochloric acid and you dump it in there for a swim, pretty much it's just going to generate a lot of H pluses really quickly. Obviously, fluoride as well, not that important towards acidity. But the presence of all those free H pluses is what's going to make that solution pretty acidic because that is pretty much your definition of an acid is something that has the ability to produce free H plus in solution. Same thing for the rest of these here. We'll get H3O plus and nitrate for our nitric acid, a little H3O plus and our perchlorate. aqueous symbols there next to them, I guess, would be right. And obviously here, uh, we would get H3O plus, and we will actually get a little HSO4 minus here, as it will donate over here. That is a, as we talked about earlier, a diprotic acid, right? And uh, sulfuric acid is a strong acid. 
but it's also diprotic, which means the second guy there, HSO4 minus, is actually a weak acid, as odd as that sounds. Um, so remember, hydrogens only come off one at a time. Now, some weak acids, we have our hydrofluoric acid, our uh, nitrous acid, and same idea here. This is going to send over our H plus, and here H3O plus and F minus H3O plus, and our nitrite here. And again, here's our second guy, as I just mentioned a second ago, is actually a weak acid that comes from sulfuric acid. And that's going to get us our H3O plus and our SO4 two minus and our H3O plus and our OH minus, also known as our KW, right? That's basically our KW equation that we saw earlier. So difference here is pretty much in solution, that is what you got floating around. So once again, if you had something like hydrofluoric acid and you dumped it in there, you're gonna be stuck with a bunch of HF units still together, but it will again break apart a little bit and produce a few ions in that solution, but a majority of it will still stay together. Again, it still is able to produce some H plus in solution, which is why it's an acid, but it's considered a weak acid. It will not be able to produce anywhere near the extent of H plus in that solution as, say, hydrochloric acid. Our strong bases are also strong electrolytes. So as I mentioned before, if you look on the periodic table, like group one and group two on the periodic table, these guys here, you hook these guys up pretty much with hydroxide. Our alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, that's where a lot of our strong bases come from. And same idea with our strong bases here, just like our strong acids. If you were to dump some sodium hydroxide in, you're going to produce a bunch of sodiums. But more importantly, you're going to produce a bunch of free OH minuses floating around in that solution. And again, the presence of all that OH minus is going to make that solution basic because remember, again, that... H plus and OH minus concentrations are related to each other. So as this one goes up, we see the H plus concentration go down. The result of that is the pH will go up, right? So we'll have a higher pH because of the presence of all that OH minus. It's basically bringing down the H plus concentration and will raise the pH in that solution. Questions on that there? <clears throat> And of course, we do have some weak bases as well. And here's a couple of those F minus. In this case, it's going to accept the H plus acting as the base here. And that will actually produce HF and OH minus. So it will actually produce where it comes from, actually, which is very interesting. Uh, but more importantly, here we'll produce some hydroxide, which means that uh, it's going to be a base. It's not going to produce, again, anywhere near the amount of hydroxide that just dumping sodium hydroxide in there will do. Because all sodium hydroxide has to do, frankly, is go for a swim and it's going to break apart. F minus, got to go find some water, do a little reaction to produce a little bit of hydroxide. So it's a little bit more work, if you will, uh, for it to do it. Same idea here. We're going to send our H plus over that way. Going to make a little nitrous acid and, again, our hydroxide. Uh, which is why each of these are still considered a base. But again, a much weaker base. We still see our reversible reactions happen here. Now, there is some really important sort of relationships between acids, for example, and their conjugate partners, conjugate acids and conjugate bases. And it's really important for something we're going to talk about in this chapter a little later on. But uh, the relationship is this. If you have an acid and its partner would be the conjugate base on the other side of the arrow. If your acid is strong, its conjugate base partner on the other side will be relatively weak. And what that means is, as we will talk about, is it pretty much will not continue to react. So if you have some type of conjugate base that comes from something strong, you don't have to worry about it reacting in a way, as we will talk about, that will affect the pH. So it won't have really any effect on the pH, that guy, because it's relatively weak. 
Opposite is true, though. If your asset is weak, is conjugate partner is going to be relatively strong. And that is a little worrisome in terms of pH because if you have something that comes from a weak acid, it's going to be relatively strong and it's going to actually start reacting by itself. And it will have an actual effect on pH, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, but it will have an actual effect on pH because it's got the ability to interact. Bases work the same way. So if you have a base, it's partner on the other side there would be as conjugate acid. And if it's a strong base, uh, its conjugate acid partner will be relatively weak. So in the sort of context of pH, you would not have to worry about it reacting or affecting the pH if it's present uh, because it comes from a strong base. But if you do have a weak base, its conjugate acid partner will be relatively strong. And much like what we saw or talked about here with our acid, and its conjugate base, this conjugate acid will have the ability to actually affect the pH. And we're going to talk about how that will do that shortly. Uh, but it will have the ability basically to continue to react and affect the actual pH of that solution. So there's sort of an opposite relationship. And that's why it's important in a lot of things that we do, especially in this chapter and such, uh, that you understand where, for example, that substance comes from in certain cases, because it can have an effect on uh, you know, the pH of that solution. H3O plus is the strongest acid and OH minus is the strongest base that you could have. Um, here's a table from your book there. And again, you can see our list there of our kind of six strong acids. And again, they have sort of an opposite relationship. Um, there's our weaker partners, so strong acids, weak partners, weak acids, stronger partners down on this end. So again, that opposite relationship. As I mentioned before, those six, if you remember, you'll be in good shape to know if it's strong or weak and stuff like that. So once again, if we do have a strong acid or even a strong base, it will 100% break apart into the ions. And again, in terms of pH, if it's an acid, that would give you perhaps the H plus concentration. And if that's a base, it will give you the OH minus concentration. As you can see here, pretty much our weak guy is going to stay together, a lot less ionization happening. So why don't you calculate the pH of each of these guys here? Uh, what is the pH of 2 times 10 to the minus 3 nitric acid and 1.8 times 10 to the minus 2 molar barium hydroxide? Okay, so let's take a look at it. First off, important thing to realize, obviously, here is this is not like one of those generic questions, but they actually did give us a form of an acid, which in this case is nitric acid. And as we just talked about, nitric acid is one of those strong acids, which means when it's in solution, it will 100% break apart into its ions. Right, so we got 100% of these guys. And we do have the concentration of this guy. Now, in terms of pH, the important part here is the amount of H plus that we have in solution. And perhaps you remember in terms of concentration, that is a one to one relationship, uh, which means that the concentration of this guy would also be two times 10 to the minus three molar. We're not sure about that when we just do the long calculation to refresh your memory of how that works. By the way, that is moles per liter of nitric acid. Mole to mole relationship. It's a one to one mole to mole relationship between those two. One mole of nitric acid, one mole of H plus, the moles of nitric acid cancel. And that leaves you two times 10 to the minus three moles per liter of H plus basically stoichiometry, yeah? So it's so a one-to-one, you get the same concentration. That means that that's really what we need there for our pH. Our pH is equal to minus the log of the H plus concentration, uh, minus the log, in this case, of two times 10 to the minus three. Try to hit the right button this time. Let's see here. 
after that. It's about the inverse long. I was thinking it was a pH of 2.7 in this case, uh, which is acidic. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a strong acid, right? Any questions on that there? Now, if we look at uh, the second one there, that's barium hydroxide, which is a strong base, right? Again, if you go group one to group two, lithium, sodium, potassium, hang a right of calcium, and then down, uh, again, those guys with hydroxide will be strong. Uh, so this means that this guy will also 100% break apart into a barium ion and two hydroxide ions in this case. That means that the concentration of the whole thing here, 1.8 times 10 to the minus two molar. When we look at hydroxide here, which is important to get not the pH, but it will allow us to get the pOH, uh, or the H plus concentration, however approach you want to take it. It is a one to two relationship, which means to get the proper concentration of hydroxide, you need to multiply it by two. For the same reasons, because the mole to mole relationship will be a one to two relationship in that case. And you'll get two times 1.8 to the minus two. That gives us the proper concentration here of hydroxide, which is 0 0.0036. We now could go into the pOH, again, not the pH, with that number. And if I do that there, don't put comma, there we go. I end up with a 1.44. Now, if by some chance you got confused and you uh, thought this was the pH value, uh, that definitely should not make sense to you, right? Because that would be more like an acidic pH and you're dealing with a base. So here, obviously, we need to use the pH is equal to 14 minus our pOH. And that will be 14 minus 1.44. And that's going to give us more appropriate actual pH of 12.56. Any questions on that? You obviously also could, if you wanted to, uh, took the 0 0.036 and use KW, got the H plus, and also then went into the pH equation if you wanted to do uh, that approach as well. Again, should give you the same answer. So sometimes you may not be given a, a generic H plus or OH minus concentration. They may give you something like this that's a strong acid or a strong base. You do want to make sure that you have the right concentration. I would say probably out of the strong acids and strong bases, the strong base might be the place like we did there on the bottom that you might have to adjust the concentration as most strong acids are monoprotic, which means whatever the concentration of the acid is will be the concentration of the H plus because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Any questions on that there? All right, then uh, let's talk about uh, what happens. Obviously, here's a table of our strong acids and strong bases. And again, basically what we just talked about there on the periodic table and also our six strong acids. What happens with weak acids and weak bases? Those calculations are different. And that's because when you look at those calculations or those reactions, they are reversible reactions, which means that feels very ice table-ish that's going to happen here. So if we take a weak acid like this here, it's going to break apart into H plus and A minus. And because this is an equilibrium, we could write an equilibrium constant for it. This works the same way as all of our other equilibrium constants. It is products over reactants. We still would take coefficients as our exponents. And in this case, uh, we have H plus times OH minus, H plus times A minus divided by HA. And that is equal to Ka. I'm going with acid dissociation constant there for Ka. So we'll add that to our ever-growing list of K values, Kc, Kp, Kw, now Ka. Uh, and again, it is still an equilibrium constant. It doesn't really matter what the little letter is. It's all the same products over reactants. We still do not include anything that's a pure liquid or a solid. If you should happen to have that in the equation, uh, they are left off. So as the Ka value increases, so does the strength of the weak acid. So let's talk about why that would be. If I have a large K value, that means that I mainly have reactants or products at equilibrium. Large K value is 
reactants or products? It is products, yes. So uh, that would mean that we would mainly have products at equilibrium. And if we mainly have products at equilibrium, that means that we will have more H plus free in the solution floating around. So that would mean that is a stronger weak acid. So that's comparison of a weak acid to a weak acid. Nowhere near still a strong acid. Strong acid is much stronger. But if you're comparing sort of a weak acid to a weak acid, the larger the Ka value, the stronger the weak acid will be. So we do solve these problems. We still will do an ice table here to solve these guys, like our equilibrium problems. The difference is here, pretty much at the end, we're usually interested in the H plus concentration. So we're usually interested in the H plus concentration so we can then put it into the pH equation. So that's sort of the difference between this and a basic equilibrium type problem. Works the same way. Uh, if you need a quadratic, you can. If you can make your assumption, you can. If you can square root it, you can. Uh, but really, in the end, we take the H plus concentration and calculate the pH from it. So that's sort of the little added step that we do with it. Again, works the same way in terms of those other calculations. Here's a table of some weak acids from your book, which you may have to reference for homework problems and stuff. Again, they may not give you the Ka values. A lot of times you may have to look it up. If you're looking up Ka values, do you look it up from a legitimate source? Yes. So uh, look it up from your book or someplace like that. And here's some different Ka values for each of these things. So why don't you give it a go? Again, like I said here, we want to calculate the pH of 0.5 molar hydrofluoric acid. And there's the Ka value for hydrofluoric acid from the table. Uh, again, you want to do an ice table, figure out the pH based off of that. So it takes some minutes there and work through it, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So again, uh, first off, uh, we want to make sure we don't overlook some common things in the problem uh, that might be helpful for you. First off, I see a Ka value here. So automatically, right, I know that this acid is what type of acid? going to be a weak acid, right? So that automatically tells me that I should be doing an ice table here. So these are things you want to kind of look at in the problems to help you maybe decide how you should approach it. To do an ice table, I really need an equation here of how this guy's going to break apart. And since he is a weak acid, he's going to break apart like any other acid, except that we're going to have some reversible arrows happening there. And again, if you do want to include the water on the left, you can. You'll just have H3O plus on the right. But I'm going to leave off the water here and just do the H plus. This means that we will have a Ka expression of our products, which is H plus times F minus divided by HF. And obviously, if you included water in your equation, you would leave it off in the Ka expression. That would equal, I'm running out of room, so I'll just draw an arrow, equals that number right there. So we can do our ice table like normal. We're going to go with uh, 0 0.5. And again, just like those kind of equilibrium problems we had earlier, we're not mentioned about anything on the product side. So always safe to assume zero in this case. This also means that it should be safe to assume that it is heading, obviously, in the product direction, which means our minuses should be on the left. So it's going to be minus x plus x plus x. And that means that when we're all said and done here, 0 0.5 minus x, x, and x. Any questions on the ice table here? By the way, you do need to show the ice table in your problems to get credit, full credit. So make sure you do with the equation and all that kind of stuff. Just like we did in chapter 13, we're now going to take the goal here is to figure out what x is. So we're just going to take everybody and pop it into our expression. And if we do that, that will basically give us x squared on top, 0 0.5 minus x equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. At this point here, we do have a small value of k. Uh, so we can perhaps assume that x is equal to 0 if you want to. And remember that when we assume x is equal to 0, we can only try that when we have a k value that's small, which is less than one. 
and it's only the x's that we're going to subtract from a number or add to a number that are the ones that we basically get rid of. That will then make this x squared divided by 0 0.5 is equal to 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. We're going to multiply this to the other side. Then we're going to do a little square root action. And that's going to give us an x value after we take 0.5 times 6.4 to the minus 4. We're going to square root it. And that'll get us an x value here of 0 0.017885. Remember that when we do make the assumption, we do need to check it to make sure it's okay. Otherwise, we have to go back and solve it some other way. A reminder to check your assumption is to take the x value that you just got. You're going to divide it by what you're going to subtract it from which is really the initial concentration, times it by 100%. And if you do that there, you got something like 3.6%, which means this check is good. It is less than 5%, which is our cutoff for being not so good. Any questions on how to check it there? Now that we've checked it, uh, that means that really in this case, the only thing we're interested in is really the H plus concentration so that we could get to the pH. Uh, so that means that the concentration of H plus will equal X, which equals 0 0.017885 molar. That's going to go into our pH here. And that's going to give us a pH here of... 1.75, I believe, here, if I set in right there. Any questions on that one there? So again, you can see here, it really does work the same way as what we did in chapter 13. Again, the additional thing is throwing it into that pH equation. Remember, you still need to check. Any questions on that there? Now, why do you need to check? Let's just say we have the same one, but the concentration was 0 0.05. The initial concentration does make a difference. So if we just kind of do our ice table here, and we started with 0 0.05 instead of 0.5 like we had previously, the rest of the ice table here will look pretty similar except obviously this is going to be 0 0.05 minus x, x and x. This will go into our Ka expression, which would be x squared 0 0.05 minus x equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4, which I think that was the number there. Yep. And now if we make our assumption here, assume that x is equal to 0, we end up with x squared 0 0.05 equals 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4. Same deal, we're going to multiply and then square root it. And if we do that there, we end up with an x value of 0 0.005657. When we go to check it now and divide it by 0 0.005 and times it by 100% in this case, we end up with like an 11.3%, which is a bad, would not be so good. So we could not do the assumption here. Just a reminder that it does not always work. The difference between those, even though they both got fives in the concentration, is the first guy's concentration was larger than this one, right? Significantly larger, about 10 times as large the concentration to begin with than what we have here. Yeah. It, it's really not. I just wrote an extra zero. Thank you. Sorry about that. It is obviously uh, 0 0.05 there. I think my calculations, I piped it in right. I just wrote it wrong. Yeah. Other questions? So uh, the idea there is, like I said, the previous one that we did was five times or 10 times the concentration there of this one. So if you think about it, if you have a larger concentration to start with and you lose a little, it's not as big of a percentage if you started with a smaller concentration and lost a little. Again, I go back to like the pizza example. If you have a whole pizza, take one piece out, 
not a big percentage of the whole pizza pie, right? But if you have a pizza box that has two pieces of pizza left and you take one piece, right? Now that's a bigger percentage of what you started with, right? So if you have a smaller concentration, even though it's a weak acid, it's only going to lose a little bit of H+. Plus, that little bit that it loses is significant compared to where it started. Then if you had a larger concentration and it loses a little, it's still going to be a less of a percentage that's lost. Any questions all out there? All right. So as we just saw in those examples, uh, pretty much we work these weak problems the same way as a regular equilibrium problem. Uh, again, you could roll through any of your assumptions. If you don't want to do the assumption, you could quadratic it up if you needed to. Um, now, one of the assumptions that we make in most of our problems here is this. Uh, we assume that all of the H plus that we see in the solution when we're dealing with acid and bases are all of the OH minus that we see in the solution when we're dealing with bases uh, comes from just the acid or the base itself. Now, there is definitely water in there. And as we talked about, water itself will ionize, right? And have H plus and OH minus that's in the solution from the water part of it. So for us, we ignore any of the water's contribution when we do these calculations. I will say not all books will do that. Sometimes you'll see an answer and it'll go, well, what you got is way less than what water was to begin with. So we're just going to kind of use the H plus concentration from water and stuff like that. So for us, we're not going to do that. We're going to assume, like I said, that water is not breaking apart in this sense and that the only H plus or OH minus that you see floating around that solution came from either the acid or the base. And we will ignore sort of water's contribution. Um, Let's try one here again. So try this one here. We have a monoprotic acid that has a 0.122 molar concentration, has a Ka value of 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. What is the pH of it? If you don't know what you could use for a monoprotic acid formula, you could use HA. Uh, so obviously monoprotic acid means uh, basically it gives off one hydrogen. And if you don't have a formula to use, you can use this as a sort of a generic formula for a monoprotic acid. If you need a diprotic acid sort of general formula, you can use H2A. And if you need a triprotic, which uh, can give three hydrogens, H3A. The difference though is here A is A minus, here A is A2 minus, and here A has a minus three charge, which is why you have the three hydrogens, the two hydrogens, and the one hydrogen. So in this case, we're monoproducting it up like HCl, for example, but uh, we'll just use this generic guy. We know it's a weak acid because it does have a Ka value, so it should have the two arrows and should break apart into this where our Ka would be, again, our products uh, divided by our reactants. And that obviously equals our 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Get to the end there. 4 minus 4. All right. So doing our ice table here, uh, we got 0 0.122, a 0, and a 0. Again, change here going to be minus x plus x plus x. That means when we get to equilibrium here, 0 0.122 minus x, x, and x any questions on the table or anything like normal we're going to now take these guys and put it into our ka expression here that should get us x squared uh, divided by 0 0.122 minus x equals our 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4. we could assume that x is equal to 0 here that will give us x squared uh, 0 0.122 equals 5.77 times 10 to the minus 4. That would get us an x value if we multiply 0 0.122 times 5.7. I put an extra 7 for good measure there. Uh, t to the minus 4. And a little square root action there. Going to give us an x value there of 0 0.008339. We check it by dividing by 0.122 and times by 100%. 
We're not going to be so good, I think, here. So something like 6.8%, which means no good. So we do have to go back and solve it. Remember, 5% is our cutoff for being okay. And this obviously is above the 5% rule. So we need to back it up here and actually solve this probably through our quadratic. So we're going to then multiply what's on the bottom to the other side. And that will give me x squared is equal to 0 0.122 times by 0.7 to the minus 4. Uh, 0 0.00006954 minus 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4x. We're going to bring everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody to the same side. So I'm just going to bring everybody that way. And that's going to give me x squared plus 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4x minus 0 0.00006954 equals 0. That's going to be my uh, A, uh, B, and C, right, for my quadratic here. And again, we do want to take the negative there with the uh, C one. So that's going to give me X is equal to, obviously, minus B, right, plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A. So minus B would be uh, minus 5.7 times 10 to the minus 4 plus or minus the square root. And if we do what's inside the square root, we'll take uh, b squared minus four times a, which is one, times our negative 0 .00, uh, 0.00006954. That will get us inside the square root, something like 0 0.00027845, I think. And then if we take the square root of it, we'll get us uh, something like 0 0.01669, we'll call it, I guess. And we're going to divide it all by 2 times 1, which is 2. Again, this should give us uh, two x values here, I think. So minus 5.7 uh, to the minus 4 uh, plus our answer there, divided by 2, going to get us there. 1x value doing the positive or adding of 0 0.008059. Or if we do the subtraction, minus 5.7 uh, to the minus 4 minus 0 0.01669 divided by 2. That's going to give us, obviously, here a negative number of 0 0.00863. Any questions on that there? Clearly, since we are interested in our H plus and we got a couple of X's here, the negative is not going to work for us, right? So it's got to be the positive value here. That means that this guy here basically equals the H plus concentration. And we could use that to calculate the pH, which would be minus the log 0 0.008059. And that's going to get us there. a 2.09 in terms of the pH in this case. Any questions on that one? So again, another good example of uh, make sure you do check it will not always work. A lot of times it will, but there are definitely places where it will not work. Any questions on that one there? Please. All right, try another one here. Calculate the H plus concentration. And we'll do the pH as well. For our HCN, that has a concentration of 0 0.010 molar and has a K. Okay, so let's take a look since we're getting to the end here. Once again, we see a Ka tells us this is definitely a weak acid. Also tells us we should probably do an ice table here. So we're going to start with our HCN. It's going to break apart into H plus and CN minus here. We will have a Ka expression of our products divided by our reactants. And that will equal our 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. 
We're going to do our ice table here. So uh, 0 0.01, 0, and 0. Again, here uh, our change minus x plus x and plus x, giving us that equilibrium. 0 0.01 minus x, x, and x. Questions up to there. So uh, like we've been doing, we're going to put that into our expression. That will give us basically x squared divided by 0 0.01 uh, minus x equals 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. We're going to make our assumption here since we do have obviously a low value of k. And that will give us x squared over 0 0.01 equals 6.2 times 10 to the minus 10. Once again, here we're going to multiply and then square root it. And that will get us an x value when we do that. There of. Square root action there. This is an x value of uh, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. We do want to check it, so we'll uh, take that and we'll take our 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. We'll divide it by what we're going to subtract it from, 0 0.01 times it by 100. And we should be in pretty good shape, I think, here. Times it by 100. Yeah, you're not even 0.1%, I think 0.02%, something like that. So the check here is good. That means that that X value should be our H plus concentration, which was one of the questions, which means it should be that guy right there. Uh, that also means we can now use that to calculate our pH, negative log of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6. going to give us a 5.60 in terms of our pH in this case. Any questions on any of that there? All right, we will lay it up there for today.